Hello everyone and welcome to Cram Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. Um, today we are going to have a look at a paper recently published in Annals of Surgery entitled Synthetic vs. Biological Nash in Laparoscopic and Open Ventral Hernia Repair, the LAPSIS randomized clinical trial. Uh, this is followed by a brief summary of uh, the discussion we've had about the paper itself. Uh, and finally, uh, Professor Sababala Subramanian uh, will deliver another uh, teaching session on descriptive statistics. And uh, in this particular part of it, uh, he will be focusing on how we can represent data in tables uh, and charts. This will be the second of three uh, of these sessions. So stay tuned for more. All right, good evening everyone. My name is Mohamed uh, Kogali with my colleague Gio. We'll be presenting a paper that was published in January 2021 about the synthetic versus biological mesh in laparoscopic and open uh, ventral hernia repair. Um, Gio, would you tell us about a bit about the background and why it is relevant? Yeah, of course. I mean, um, the world of ventral hernia repair um, has a lot of open questions uh, still um, two of them are definitely whether we should uh, use an open approach or a laparoscopic approach and whether we should use a synthetic or a biologic mesh. Uh, the standard sort of so far in the literature has been the open repair with a retromuscular mesh placement according to guidelines. But since the early 90s, laparoscopic repair uh, did sort of gain some traction and has been adopted in some centers particularly quite widely. Um, Synthetic versus biologic mesh is a, a completely different question. Um, there is an argument uh, towards using biologic meshes uh, outside the traditional realm of contaminated procedures uh, because there is some evidence that a synthetic mesh does cause a little bit of long-term problems, particularly with pain and symptoms. However, again, the level of evidence is pretty low. Uh, we presume that this problem is more significant when the mesh is in contact with the bowel. Um, there are also a counter argument that has to do with the fact that a biologic mesh is an absorbable scaffold and therefore could potentially provide not very good long term support to the abdominal wall. Um, hopefully this trial will manage to cast some light on on this couple of problems. So more back to you. All right. Thank you, Gio. So the aims of the study were firstly to identify the optimal surgical approach, uh, the laparoscopic or open. Secondly, to identify the most suitable mesh, either biological or synthetic, and elective non-contaminated ventral hernia repairs within three years post-operatively. Uh, back to you, Gio, to explain the PECO model. Yeah, of course. So uh, P or patients in this case would be adults affected by primary ventral or incisional hernia, uh, including recurrences. Um, the intervention would be the laparoscopic approach, um, or biologic mesh, uh, which is compared to the open approach or the use of a synthetic mesh. Uh, the outcome in this particular trial is a composite of hernia recurrence, mesh infection, reoperation within three years uh, post-op. Uh, Bo, back to you, mate. Thank you, Gia. Uh, looking at the methods, uh, this is a randomized controlled trial with two times two factorial design between 2005 and 2009. Multicentral, uh, multicentral, which involved 17 study sites in 10 European countries, uh, variable block size to assign patients in one to one to one to one ratio. Stratification was performed according to study center and hernia type, either primary or incisional. Uh, double bl blinded for the type of mesh that was used. Uh, from this, two questions were created, the first being superiority of laparoscopic approach versus open, the second being non-inferiority of biological mesh versus synthetic. Uh, 
Um, Gio, do you want to take us through the in inclusion and in exclusive criteria, please? Of course. So in order to be eligible for this trial, um, patients had to be 18 years old or older and suffering from a primary incision or hernia. Uh, this can be recurrent, provided that previously no mesh was used. Uh, there had to be no contraindication to laparoscopic repair, and the orifice has to be between 4 and 10 centimeters. Uh, where more than one orifice was present, uh, the sum of the orifices was accepted as um, an eligibility criteria. So two 2 centimeter defects would make you eligible for this trial. Uh, people not fit for surgery or pregnant were excluded. Uh, Non-elective uh, procedures or contaminated procedures were excluded. A lumbar parastomal and generally speaking hernias uh, with less than, than three centimeters from a bone edge were also excluded. Uh, when more than one mesh was needed or a large mesh more than 20 by 20 or 22 by 13 was required, uh, the patient was excluded from the trial as well. Uh, back to you, Mo. Thanks, Gio. Uh, before we discuss the outcomes, I'll briefly run you through the um, 11 standards adhered to in the surgical repair of hernia. Uh, number one, the surgery was performed by a consultant. Number two, a single dose of second generation kephalosporin was given. Um, a five centimeters overlap of the circumferential mesh was recommended. A case-by-case -case approach used with regards to facial covering. A prolene mesh was used in open repair. A number six, and the biological uh, the biological mesh used was surges as gold. In laparoscopic repair, the synthetic mesh used was either a composite mesh or a EPTFE mesh. Again, in laparoscopy, no attempt was made to remove the hernial sac or fascia. After laparoscopic repair, a binder was applied uh, until discharge at least. Number 10, all patients were advised to avoid heavy lifting and sports for three weeks post-operatively. And finally, multiple follow-up appointments was given throughout the trial's three years durations, as we can see. The primary endpoint uh, was the occurrence of, the, of at least one of the following events, hernia recurrence mesh infection or reoperation within three years postoperatively. The secondary outcomes, uh, the secondary endpoint were local complications, mortality and abdominal wall pain, which was assessed with visual analog. Additional endpoints were oper uh, additional uh, endpoints were operation time, length of hospital stay, time of return to work and patient satisfaction. The expected number of patients to be recruited uh, were 660 patients. And the expected primary outcome rate based on previous studies was the lowest in laparoscopic biological mesh repair and the highest was in open synthetic repair. Looking at the results in this consort flow diagram, 253 patients were randomized. 61 assigned for open repair with synthetic mesh, 66 of them were assigned for open repair with biological mesh, 64 assigned for laparoscopic repair with synthetic mesh, and finally 62 assigned lapar for laparoscopic repair with biological mesh. Uh, Gio, do you want to take us through the consult diagram in more details? Yeah, of course. Uh, just a few points about uh, this um, uh, slide. Um, I wanted to highlight how on average uh, a quarter of the patients that were enrolled in this trial did not receive their allocated intervention. And this, as you can see, varies uh, quite a lot uh, in, in the four groups, particularly for the open synthetic, it's as high as 36%. And a, another point worth mentioning is that, as you noticed, uh, the number of patients recruited is significantly lower than 660. And this is one of the two reasons why the trial was uh, prematurely stopped because of slow recruitment after four years. Uh, ball back to you, Mo. Thank you, Gia. And in this table, we can see that the BMI range was very close for all patients, which accounted for around 29. And the majority of patients were non-smokers. The most common type of hernia was incisional, which accounted for around 60% of the patients. The largest hernia was 6.6 .6 centimeters, and the smallest one was 6 centimeters.
The average length of stay in hospital was around five days for the open hernia repair and four days for the laparoscopic repair. And the, um, the primary outcome was the highest in laparoscopic biological repair, which accounted for 27.4% followed by 22.7% for open biological mesh repair. In table number five, it shows that 25% of patients whom underwent biological mesh repair had at least one major complication. Um, back to you, Gio, to tell us more about the analysis of primary endpoint. Yeah, um, thank you. So uh, this is um, a disease-free analysis that the authors conducted and again reiterates the point that uh, uh, the use of a biological mesh in this particular trial seems to be associated with a significantly higher risk of developing the primary outcome and particularly in this case recurrence of the hernia. And this is the second reason why this trial was stopped prematurely uh, because the biological mesh was associated with an acceptable uh, high number of uh, complications. And as you would expect, uh, they do have a decent um, adherence to follow up. Um, the population at risk remains reasonably stable throughout the three years um, of the trial. Uh, ball back to you, Mo. Thank you, Gio. And in this table, I've highlighted a few post-operative complications, such as wound infection, seroma, and bulging. We can see that the, they were high among the open biological mesh repair subgroup which was five, in wood, uh, five for the wound infection, 19 for the seromas, and 18 for the bulging. There are some self-reported limitations that were mentioned, such as the trial was prematurely stopped due to high complications in relation to biological mesh, as earlier as uh, was mentioned earlier. Uh, slow recruitment there were only 253 patients recruited instead of 660 expected, and generalizability of findings to other biological mesh. Um, Gio, do you, wanna, do you want to tell us about the other limitations? Yeah, of course. So these are a few points that we picked up uh, as we were going through uh, the methodology and the results. Um, I couldn't really get my head around how they uh, reconcile the sample size calculations. Uh, first of all, because they um, had two different designs to start with. So uh, one was uh, a non-inferiority um, arm and the other one was a superiority arm. And also when they realized that the biological mesh was significantly underperforming compared to the um, synthetic mesh, they um, swapped to uh, a design to identify superiority of a um, synthetic mesh. Uh, and again, I'm not entirely sure how they reconcile these changes into the sample size calculation. It might be a little bit academic considering that the trial has been stopped uh, early, but still, um, it's a question I have in my head. Um, they don't mention at all how their actual findings are exactly the opposite of their expected findings. So if you remember when we talked about the outcomes, the lowest complication rate that they were expecting were both in laparoscopic and open biological mesh repair, and they found exactly the opposite. Uh, there's quite a lot of crossover um, and uh, surgeons that appear to change the type of mesh that they uh, want to use, uh, particularly, uh, as we mentioned, in the uh, open synthetic mesh repair group. Um, they did not have an interim analysis uh, for this trial. Uh, the trial was stopped based on recommendations of a committee, but there was no statistical a sort of um, background uh, for that recommendation. Uh, all the results that they report are uh, odds ratios rather than relative risks. Now, this is not necessarily a limitation, but we discussed the importance of using relative risks whenever possible uh, in one of our previous episodes. Um, from a technical perspective, there's two things that I want to highlight. Um, one is the cost argument. Um, biological meshes, uh, despite uh, sort of becoming more mainstream, uh, are still quite expensive, more expensive than a traditional proline mesh. And if we start our trial with um, the assumption, uh, or at least trying to demonstrate, that uh, the biological mesh is not inferior to um, a synthetic mesh, then the cost argument should at least be mentioned. Um, and the, the authors don't really touch on it at all. Um, from a technical perspective, finally, um, the authors do standardize the procedure as more uh, very clearly explained. However, they do leave to uh, the surgeon uh, whether the anterior sheath after placing um, uh, 
the hernia in the retromuscular position in an open repair uh, is closed or not, and uh, by how much. And they don't report in how many patients this is closed and this is not closed. Uh, so, Bob, back to you uh, more for the conclusions. All right, thank you very much. So, in, in conclusion, it can it can be said that surgery as gold uh, biological mesh should not be used for clean, non-complex ventral hernias. Secondly, uh, laparoscopic or open approaches are valid for small and medium-sized ventral hernias. Um, the table below summarizes the main points that were discussed throughout the presentations. Um, and that's all. Thank you for everyone for listening. So during the discussion uh, concerning this paper, uh, there were a few additional points that were highlighted. Uh, we focused on the fact that uh, as mentioned, this is a multi-center trial involving 17 centers from different countries, pretty much all throughout Europe. Uh, this does have some implications related particularly to the um, variability of expertise and volume in different centers, which becomes particularly important when we are comparing laparoscopic and open approaches. Now, the authors mentioned that the uh, number of procedures that a consultant surgeons need to have performed before enrolling in this trial uh, is 25. However, it is very likely that uh, there will be significant differences between um, various centers involved. And this um, could significantly affect the results concerning biological and synthetic mesh. As in terms of comparing those two particularly, uh, you ideally would want the most homogeneous background possible. A further point we discussed um, is related by the uh, choice of a composite outcome. Uh, traditionally in uh, um, hernia trials, uh, particularly for uh, groin hernias, uh, recurrence has been used as the uh, main outcome for a study. So we are wondering why uh, the authors would choose a composite outcome rather than simply focusing on uh, uh, recurrences. This does have implications, particularly for sample size calculations, that it makes the primary outcome itself more common. And finally, we discussed the sample size calculations issues, which we highlighted how uh, are particularly challenging in the context of a 2x2 two two factorial design trial. So we will be asking the authors for um, clarifications, and we will let you know. Stay tuned for more. I'll leave you with Professor Sala teaching session. Thanks. Okay. So this is um, Descriptive Statistics Part 2, um, so uh, if you haven't heard the Part 1 um, talk, um, it's there on YouTube, so have a look at it, and, uh, and hopefully that'll be useful, but I'm going to crack on with this. Right. Oh, uh, just a quick recap of what we learned in Part 1. So we talked about data types, we talked about normal distribution, and the parameters that um, are used to describe the data based on the data type and the normal distribution. So this is what we talked about last time. And in this talk, we're going to talk about um, graphs, charts, and tables, and the appropriate um, graph, chart, or table to use when you describe data uh, or, or when you're reading a paper to decide on what's appropriate and what may not be. So before we go um, into graphs, charts, and tables, uh, I thought we should revisit data types because uh, a lot depends on data type. So this is the slightly complex table that we discussed in the last talk. And I'm just going to ask you to focus on the differences between categorical data and measurement or scale data, also called quantitative data. So categorical data is basically data that is nominal or ordinal, which is qualitative. Uh, in other words, you're uh, putting the values into categories. So a good example would be gender, male or female. Another example would be city in the UK, Edinburgh, London, Glasgow, and so on. So th those are um, data types uh, with, wherein you put the values into categories, so you don't measure them. And um, on the other hand, measurement or scale data or quantitative data is something that you can count. And there are a number, of, a couple of different types of these, but uh, we won't go into uh, this detail in this talk. So moving on to graphs, charts, and tables. So in a report, a graph, chart, or table 
should be necessary, should be there for a specific objective. It should be obviously relevant and clear. It should improve the reader's understanding of the data, and it should add to the results section to enhance it, to improve it. Now, you could either use tables or charts and graphs, and for the same kind of data that you want to describe, um, you could use one of the two, and they're often interchangeable. But in some settings, uh, a table is preferable, and in some other settings, a chart or graph is preferable. For example, charts and graphs are better if you want to depict certain complex relationships, and also sometimes where space is an issue. And often space is an issue um, if you are asked to do a really short presentation um, and you're given uh, restrictions on the amount of time and therefore the number of slides you're going to use. And if you're going to publish a paper where often the journal would say you can only have 3,000 words or uh, you can only have uh, up to three or four printed pages and so on. Tables, however, are better for um, describing a mixture of data types. And I'll we'll show you an example. And also, if you wanted to be very specific about the exact values, or if you want to give precise values, then, then obviously a table would be preferable. Right. So why use charts, graphs, and tables in the first place? I mean, this is um, self-explanatory. Obviously, it facilitates communication and improves understanding of the data that you're trying to describe. And you're structuring the data that is to be presented and you're improving the clarity of the presentation by using charts, graphs, and tables. The other um, reason for using these um, uh, charts, graphs, and tables are to reduce reader time in assimilating information. So rather than go through two or three pages of results, you could look at a couple of graphs and tables and, um, and get the information you need. And many of us, don't read all of the text in a paper. We go straight to the graphs and tables and try and get the information we need and we move on. And they also help reduce word count and space in a, in a report in a paper. And a good graph or chart can encourage a reader to investigate the paper further, just like a good abstract. So if, if you um, glance in, or if you happen to uh, um, read an abstract and you find it interesting, then you might in some instances be um, be uh, interested in spending the time to get the full text and look at the paper in more detail. Similarly, you often find graphs and um, charts on online searches. Sometimes um, journals um, allow you free access to graphs and charts, but uh, don't give you full access to the uh, paper. And the graph and chart uh, or chart is really good, and you might want to go to the library or try and get the paper to, to look at it. So that's another purpose. So uh, in general, what constitutes a good quality chart or graph? The important thing here is that this should be standalone, and it should be meaningful on its own, which means that uh, if you're looking at a table or a um, chart, you don't want to be going back and forth to the text to try and figure out what that chart or table is about. The chart um, with its heading and with the labeling and the footnotes if necessary um, should provide all of the information um, you need. So all parts should be clearly explained. And when I mean parts, and again, I'll show you some examples. I mean the heading or the legend or the caption, the footnote if one is necessary, uh, if, it, if it is a table, then the headings of the columns and rows, and so on and so forth. Professional, even if it's your first paper that, you, that you're publishing, um, it should appear prof professional. Why? Because um, a, in the appearance of a professional graph or chart implies good quality. It doesn't always mean, uh, mean good quality, but it does give the impression of good quality. And it also implies that the author has taken time and taken care in preparing the chart. And a good chart um, or graph should keep the reader um, at the focus of the data that's presented. Just like a patient that should be the focus of your clinical encounter, 
Um, and what I mean by this is that you do not want to display data or present data just because you have it. You might have done a PhD and you might have tons of data that you want to show to somebody, but that is not uh, a good reason to put the data in a paper if it's not specifically relevant to the research question. Right, before you start, think about is a graph or a chart necessary? Think about does it actually add to the results section? Does it complement it without duplication of the text? And think about, um, am I clear in what I wish to present? Do I know, can I foresee uh, what the graph or chart uh, should show? Okay, now let's start off with, ta uh, with tables, talking about tables for a minute or two. So here's a table. And this is um, a table showing some baseline features in Graves' disease, the table heading says, right? And it's got some uh, um, characteristics that is being compared in two different groups of patients. And there is some data such as male and female ratio and RIA use, whatever that is, and consultants. This is data that is um, qualitative. And then there is age duration of surgery and the hospital stay after surgery, which is quantitative. So there's a mixture of data types. OK, so let's see what the problems are in this table. Firstly, the heading doesn't really give you a full picture as to what the table is about. So heading should give a clear overview without you having to go back and forth to the text. So um, I would um, expect something like clinical and surgical um, characteristics. Uh, of patients with Graves' disease who are undergoing surgery or who are who have had antithyroid treatment or whatever it is, right? Avoid using abbreviations like MF, male and female, RIA, which probably refers to radioiodine ablation here. Uh, but if you're going to use abbreviations, put them down in a footnote. Use footnotes and expand your abbreviations and add any caveats or notes. And there are, there are several that's missing in this table. Beware of your numbers. So um, obviously there's a mistake here. So make sure that the numbers are um, accurate. And um, headings, the headings, uh, the column headings and row headings should be clear and it should be mutually exclusive. Okay. And uh, if you're going to enhance certain text, you need to add a footnote to explain what it is. And if you're going to put um, some asterisks here, then you need to um, explain what they refer to. OK, so there are quite a few problems in this table. Uh, and there's another one here. And um, there are some figures within brackets. And they probably refer to um, range or interquartile range, but it's not being explained. OK. But more. And um, so you've got some cells here. And this particular row is quite wide compared to other rows. So the cells should, um, really should be equally spaced. And you can see an alignment problem here. In this particular column that I'm highlighting, they're all aligned in the center, whereas in these other columns, they're aligned to the left. And you'll find that you, um, uh, you will encounter a lot of these problems very commonly in surgical literature. And just taking a little bit of time in preparing these tables um, properly goes a long way in creating a good impression. Right, so things to remember, you ensure that a clear and comprehensive um, heading and footnote is present. Ensure that the content is complete and accurate. We make sure that the row and column headings are clear and consistent with the content uh, of the cells. And we make sure that all acronyms are explained. It's also useful to use shading and bordering and highlighting to enhance the headings of the columns and rows, and uh, um, also sometimes highlighting areas that you want the reader to focus upon. But if you're highlighting something, then, then add a footnote to say, what is it you've highlighted and why? And that helps rapid processing of the information that the reader is coming across. Okay, things to avoid. Avoid too much data and too small font sizes. If you have a lot of data, and you're trying to put them all in one table and reducing the font, that um, usually means that you probably need more tables. Avoid too little data. If you have too little data, maybe just one row or two rows in a, in a table, um, 
you have to think about whether you really need a table or whether you can simply present that in your results section as text. It's really important to avoid data that is not essential and to avoid duplication with figures and text. And in tables, although tables are often used to give precise values, you want to avoid too much precision. Like for example, you don't want to put, uh, put down that the p-value is 0 0.0123. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to um, describe median length of stay, for example, as 3.4 days. Just three days would be sufficient. So, so much for tables. Let's move on to charts and graphs. As you've probably all heard, a picture is worth a thousand words. So charts and graphs are really important. And I just thought uh, we'll uh, dwell a little bit on charts, graphs, and plots. Are they all one and the same? They are used interchangeably. So for all practical reasons, you can consider that they are the same. However, there, there are subtle differences. Charts um, are used to describe just one variable, whereas graphs describe more than one variable or relationships between variables. And plots are ideally used when you are talking about points being plotted on a graph using coordinates like x and y axis and so on. But you'd be forgiven for um, using these words interchangeably, so I wouldn't worry too much. Now, there are a number of different types of charts and graphs and plots. And um, each software that you use to generate these from Excel to SPSS to GraphPad Prism and so on, you will find so many options and often it's it's a bit confusing as to what to go for when you've um, when you've got your results you've got your spreadsheet and you're writing your first paper and you think uh, where do i start it's useful to think about what's the main purpose of using a chart or a graph or a table and i tend to think about think of this um, uh, main purpose as one of three different sort of um, questions do I want to describe the distribution of a variable? Do I want to um, um, explain the average, the spread, or the frequencies? Do I want to describe the relationship between two variables? Is that why I want a graph? Or do I simply want to describe changes in one variable or multiple variables over time? So if you just think about this, then you can move on to um, deciding on the appropriate type of chart or graph to use. Okay, right. So those are the three questions. Describing distribution, describing relationships, and describing changes over time. If you're describing a distribution, have a think about what kind of data type it is. Is it categorical data? If it's categorical data and you've only got one variable, then you can use pie charts or bar or column charts. If you've got two variables and you can't use a pie chart, I'll come to this again in a minute. So the typical uh, thing to use is a bar or column chart. You might have heard of charts called pictographs and dot plots. These are rarely used these days, so we'll, we'll leave them be. If you have quantitative data and you want to describe it, if the data is normally distributed, remember we discussed normal distribution before, then you could use a histogram. If the data is not normally distributed, then you would use a box and whisker plot. So, so much for describing distribution of the variable that uh, you're interested in. Now, if you've got two or more variables and you want to describe relationships, then again, think about whether the data is categorical or um, quantitative or measurement. If it's categorical, you could use cluster bar chart or stack bar chart. I'll show you an example. If it's, um, so so, I'll go back one step. So if, it, when I said it is categorical, I meant both variables. So if both variables are categorical, then you use a cluster or a stack. One of the variables is categorical and the other is quantitative and you want to describe the relationship between the two, then you could use either what we call an overlapping histogram or box and whisker plots, depending on whether it's normally distributed or whether it's not normally distrib distributed. Okay, if both of the variables are quantitative, 
then um, most people would use a scatter plot. And I'll show you an example. If you then want to describe changes over time, um, in other words, if you're looking at an event that happens over time, like we often do, like we've got recurrence of a particular problem or death um, and so on, then that we refer to as time to event data and we typically use survival curves. We discussed survival curves in one of uh, our previous talk talks. I'll come uh, and describe that again uh, very briefly in a few minutes. And if you have a quantitative variable that you want to describe um, how it has changed over time, then you use something called a line graph. Okay, so these are uh, the graphs that are commonly used in clinical or medical literature. There are a number of other types of charts and graphs, but we won't um, uh, talk about them because they're very, very rarely used. Okay, now I hope you're still with me. So let's uh, look at some examples. So, assuming that you wanted to talk about distribution of a data and the data is categorical, a commonly used chart is the pie chart. There are different types of pie charts. The one on the left is a standard pie chart. The next one is what we call a donut chart where there's a gap in the middle and you can use the gap for um, putting some text in. There's a pie chart that is 3D and then there's a pie chart that's called an exploding pie chart. Now, most people would advise you to keep things simple. So avoid 3D pie charts or exploding pie charts and so on and so forth. Just try and keep things as simple as possible. That's usually uh, best when it comes to depicting data. And um, also avoid pie charts for um, categorical data with more than half a dozen categories. It just looks very cluttered and uh, the, the message that you want to give is often lost. If you have 20 or 30 different categories, different levels for a particular category, then a pie chart is really not that useful. Okay, so we're going to move on to another kind of uh, chart for describing the distribution of categorical data called the bar chart, also called the column chart, right? So if you've got just one variable say time of diagnosis and you've got interoperative, postoperative, preoperative, they're not in the right order and you just want to describe the numbers of patients in each of this category then you can use a simple bar chart that I'm highlighting in the top left of the screen. Okay now if you want to describe the distribution of two variables and you're just describing the distribution of these two variables, the variables being time of diagnosis that I'm highlighting on the x-axis in uh, cross genders, i.e. male and female, then you can use what we call a clustered bar chart or a stacked bar chart, which is the bottom. Okay, so again, bar charts are um, very commonly used, used for describing categorical data in one or two or sometimes three uh, different variables. Okay. Now, what if the data is quantitative and you want to describe it, quantitative data? Now, like I said before, if the quantitative data is normally distributed, you would use what we call a histogram, or you could use a histogram. And if the data is not normally distributed, uh, the thing to use would be what we call a box and whisker plot. So let's uh, go through this in a little bit more detail. So here's a histogram of age at diagnosis of a rare cancer. This is data from a systematic review, right? Now, you could uh, plot a histogram and um, check whether the data is normally distributed or not. And again, I won't delve into this because we've covered this before. So a histogram is often used to check for normality, right? But you don't often see histograms in reports. Why? Because you could easily and describe this data or the age of diagnosis using text. You could simply say what the mean is and what the standard deviation is and be done with it. You could uh, do that in one line and you've saved yourself a lot of space. And it's usually not necessary to repre represent uh, the data in a graphical form if all you want to describe is the distribution of the data. You can simply say the, what the mean is and what the standard deviation is. Okay, so that's why you don't often see histograms 
in, in, in papers in medical literature. Right. Now here, um, you do see box plots more often. Box plots are used to describe the distribution of data that is quantitative, but not normally distributed. Right. So um, let's look at the um, different parts of a box plot. So this is important. We use it um, not too uncommonly. So the box, the lower edge of the box represents the 25th centile. Right, the upper edge of the box represents the 75th um, uh, percentile. There's a line through the box that represents the median. So this is not the mean, this is the median, because you're talking of data that is not normally distributed. The median is not always right in the middle of the box. It's often skewed. In this particular figure, it appears to be in the middle, but it's not often the case. The whiskers, if you like, represent the minimum and the maximum data point. Now, the end of the lower end of the whisker usually represents a minimum data point that is not an outlier, and the upper end represents the maximum data point that is not an outlier. Now, what do I mean by outlier? Sometimes you find um, certain values way away from the rest of the data, and traditionally, values that are outside and um, 1.5 times the interquartile range are described as outliers. That is traditionally. Now in this data set, there are no outliers. And in some instances, some people do not depict outliers. They simply extend the whisker up to the uh, lowermost uh, value for the minimum and the uppermost value for the maximum. So it is useful to remember the meanings of these various lines. So the box, the upper and lower edges of the box refer to the 25th and the 75th percentile. And the whiskers go up to the minimum and maximum data points that are not outliers. Okay, so I hope that makes some sense. Right, we'll carry on with our uh, discussion of charts. Now, we've talked about describing the distribution of data so far. Now, we then move on to the second objective of charts and graphs, which is describing relationships. So if it's categorical data, to describe the relationships between two sets of categorical data, we use bar charts. I've already highlighted this before. So you've got the stacked bar chart on the left and the clustered bar chart on the right. And essentially here, they're describing the relationship between gender, which is categorical, and the time of diagnosis which is also category. Okay, so if you want to describe the relationship between a categorical data type and a quantitative data type, then you've either got the histogram for normally distributed data on the left, or you've got the box and whisker plot for data that is not normally distributed. Okay, and when we say normally distributed or not normally distributed, we are referring to quantitative data. And here in this example, the quantitative data is age at diagnosis. Okay, and you're comparing age at diagnosis across gender, i.e. in men and women, right? If you're happy that your age of diagnosis is normally distributed, you can use a histogram. Well, there are two histograms here. This is called an overlapping histogram, one for females and one for males. If you're not happy with um, the distribution being normal, then you assume it's not normally distributed and you draw a, a plot, a box and whisker plot for males and a box and whisker plot for females separately. Compare them. And you're looking at the relationship uh, between across genders. Right. If you are, if you want to describe the relationships between two sets of and uh, two variables that are both quantitative, then you plot what we call a scatter plot. You've probably seen scatter plots on a number of occasions. Here we've got a scatter plot comparing age of diagnosis, which is quantitative, and quality of life, which is also quantitative. This is a typical example where you would um, plot a scatter plot. Remember that in a scatter plot, you shouldn't um, draw a line, uh, a regression line, 
because here you're simply describing the relationship between two sets of data. You're not, you're not trying to infer or predict one uh, data from another. Okay. Right. Now, changes over time. So if you want to describe a variable that changes over time, and that variable is a categorical or binomial variable, such as death or recurrence, then you plot what we call a survival curve. We've discussed survival curves before. I think in the talk on measures of risk, we talked about um, survival curves and hazard ratios and so on. So um, I won't dwell on this. But remember that if you want to look at a binary variable or a categorical variable with, with two categories, and you want to look at that event that uh, happens over time, then you um, think of a survival curve. So that's the kind of graph that you would want to use. Essentially, on the x-axis, you have the time, and here it's time to death or metastasis. And on the y-axis, you have the cumulative survival, where you, uh, which um, reflects the fact that you start off your study with all patients being alive, and then over time, um, as patients uh, develop an event, which is death or metastasis here, and then the cumulative survival starts to go down. Okay. Want to, um, if you wish to describe changes over time of a quantitative variable, then you can use a simple uh, graph called the line graph. And this line graph here shows a number of cases of a rare condition uh, seen in a, in a big region, if you like, over a span of several years. So for each year, you've got a number of cases and you just join all of those dots and you get a line graph. So this depicts change in a quantitative data over time. Right, so uh, um, what are the tips and tricks for a good chart or graph? Now, um, just like with tables, it's important to have a very clear and a complete heading, heading or legend or caption. Avoid graphs with too little or too much data, and you think um, think um, whether you really need a graph in the first place. Avoid unexplained um, abbreviations. People, some people say avoid red and green pairings um, because um, people who are colorblind would, would struggle. So that's just something to keep in mind. And I would um, emphasize that you reduce unnecessary design elements. So there's a lot of uh, uh, you have at your disposal all these software that allow you to um, produce really complex looking graphs. And unless you really have a need for the complexity, um, go for the simple ones. Graphs should almost always show raw data, not summary data. There are some uh, people that display uh, summary data, such as median and mean using bar charts. They are to be discouraged. You really want to restrict the use of bar charts to uh, categorical data. You don't want to de depict median or mean that way. There are other ways of doing it. For example, if you want to um, depict medians across different groups, you would use the box and whisker plot. Okay. Now, sometimes when uh, when you have a graph and uh, there are lots of elements to it, and you want to put some labels in, you want to have grid lines. And you want, you want to have markers or asterisks and so on, that's all fine. They should complement um, a good chart or graph, but they shouldn't really hide or mask the important lines, bars, and data points. So keep that in mind. Right, we've come to the summary now. And um, so we've seen that there are several ways of describing data using tables and graphs. The important thing to keep in mind is that um, for a given da data set, you could use a number of different types of graphs or charts. Some, however, might not be appropriate. And the appropriateness really depends on the type of data, the purpose of using the, data, the graph or the chart, you know, wh what's the purpose of describing the data. And in some instances, uh, an understanding of the distribution, whether the, whether the data is normally distributed or not, if it's a quantitative variable. Okay, so next time um, we'll we'll talk about an example and we'll revisit the appropriate use of tables and charts with an example. And I'll talk about 
a special type of table called contingency table and a couple of special graphs called forest plots and funnel plots you've probably heard of. Uh, I think that will complete um, our, our lecture on descriptive statistics. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.